now this is what we, we all came for. Uh, so we, we're really pleased to have uh, two speakers who come from, uh, one comes from Kenya, one comes from Zimbabwe. Um, and they are both uh, at Lewis and Clark Law School on a special scholarship program that they bring in scholars from other countries uh, to uh, study animal law. And both of them are working animal law in their own countries. So uh, Winnie is the recipient of, the, of uh, Lewis and Clark's International Ambassador Scholarship. She holds a Bachelor of Law degree from Kampala International and a postgraduate diploma from the Kenya School of Law. She was admitted as an advocate of the High Court in Kenya in 2014, and she is an employee of the law firm Mogata, uh, um, pardon my pronunciation, <laughs> uh, and Maglea Advocates, where she currently holds the position of Associate Advocate. Among her duties are litigation, both civil and criminal, conveyance, commercial transactions, and conducting succession matters. And ever, uh, and if you pardon me, you can tell I'm not very good at that pronouncing name. So you can, uh, uh, ever uh, Chinoda uh, also received the uh, the Seno Animal Laws um, International Advocates Animal Law Scholarship. And during the program, she is on leave from her position as, as a legal office uh, of Parks and Wildlife, uh, excuse me, Parks and Wildlife Management Authority in Zimbabwe. In her capacity, her work focuses mainly on legislation graf uh, drafting, lobbying, and advocacy related to animal protection laws in Zimbabwe with both private and public stakeholders. She also watches uh, in brief uh, major cases involving wildlife trafficking, poaching, and illegal possession of ivory. As a former prosecutor, she is well suited to assist people, uh, uh, to, to assist uh, public prosecutors on cases involving wildlife across Zimbabwe. And for example, Ever was involved in the case of involving Cecil the Lion, which I think a lot of you know about yes, Cecil the yes. Lion. So, um, and without further ado, let me have you both come up here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to present. to you all. I'm Eva Chinoda. I'm from Zimbabwe. I graduated from Lewis and Clark last year in 2017 uh, with the Masters in Animal Law and I've practiced as a Zimbabwean lawyer for six years. Right now I'm working here in Portland at Carmel Savage um, as a legal assistant. And uh, this is Winnie Ankova. She comes from Kenya. She graduated yesterday. Oh. <laughs> and um, we are here to talk to you about uh, animal warfare and to just give you an African perspective of what animal warfare is and what it means and we to just shed light to you on what we've learned here in the United States through uh, the Center for um, Animal Law Studies. Um, at the school. So, we'll start. so for you to understand animal warfare in Africa or how we view or how we treat animals in Africa, the important things that you need to understand. Culture. We have cultural differences. Cultural differences between the Western people, Africans, Americans, and even cultural differences between us Africans. You also need to understand that we value animals differently. Now in Africa, wildlife is mostly, but sorry. <laughs> in Africa, you find that uh, wildlife is the most uh, wildlife is the most valued. Okay, sorry for that. So you find that in Africa, we value the wildlife mostly, and the laws that protect wildlife are more stringent, they are more deterrent as compared to laws that protect companion animals or farm animals or research animals. You also have to appreciate that we have different policies and different laws that protect and that regulate the use and the treatment of animals. So these are the four <laughs> these are the four main issues that we'll be talking about and shedding light on so that you understand what animal warfare is all about mm -hmm. in Africa. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. So um, as Eva has said, 
we all have different cultures in Africa. So where I come from in Kenya, uh, there are different practices when it comes to animals. For example, we look at uh, some communities in Kenya. We have 43 tribes in Kenya. So some of the tribes uh, value animal fighting, like cop fighting or bull fighting. Bull fighting is actually, um, it's like a customary practice in one of the Western communities in Western Kenya. So um, if you go tell them bull fighting is bad, they won't understand because they do bull fighting. It's like a ceremony for them. And the winner is awarded something. So they have practiced it over time, and that is part of their culture. We also yeah. have. Let's this one. Right. Thank you. <coughs> oh, oh, oh. So they're the same thing. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know what's wrong with this thing. I can just advance it by hand if you prefer. Yeah. Okay, just tell me when you want to switch forward. forward. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, other communities like uh, the Maasai community. Uh, in, uh, within the Maasai community, there's a rite of passage from childhood to adulthood for men. So uh, for you to, uh, to be considered an adult as a man, then you have to kill a lion. Yeah. And so there is no better way of killing that lion, just kill the lion. That is the tradition. That is initiation for you to become a man. So we have different cultures and different regards for different animals. So um, our perspectives are a bit different. We also... Um, have in Zimbabwe what we call totem. So almost every Zimbabwean is associated with a certain animal, mostly the wildlife. Like for example, my totem is a lion. When I see the lion, I respect it because that's my culture is linked to the lion. So if you have a certain totem, for example, the lion, you're not supposed to eat that kind of an animal. So you find that it is not really a law, but it is the belief, it is the culture. So because each and every tribe, each and every group is associated with a, with a certain totem, and normally the totems are area-based. So you'll find that people, maybe where they live in an elephant-dominated area, have totems for elephants, and they don't eat elephants. So that's another different kind of culture. And we also have traditional ceremonies where we use animals. For example, when, um, if you want to marry me, for example, you have to go to my father with at least nine, ten cows and say, I want to have your daughter and you can have this beast as a token of appreciation to say thank you for raising your daughter and uh, I'm appreciating you with this beast. And normally that beast is one of the nine or seven is used at the wedding ceremony or even that day when people gather, when the village <laughs> gathers, we slaughter the beast and we share and we eat the beast. That is our culture. That is how I get married. That is how you ask for a hand in marriage in Zimbabwe. Also, uh, some of the communities believe in animal sacrifices for like uh, when you have done something bad that some, it's a taboo against the community. Probably you have to slaughter a goat or a hen or a cow to somehow appease the gods so that you can be forgiven. You have to call your clan elders and come with your cow or your goat and then slaughter it, and once it sheds blood, then your sins are forgiven. So um, those are part of the rituals that people do. Yes. So now let's move on to the, to the values. Like I highlighted, we also have different values. The way we value our wildlife, our companion or domestic animals, is different from, um, is different from the way you value here. So from my observation and from the <laughs> from from my observation and from the laws here, dogs or companion animals are mostly valued. In Africa, like like what I highlighted, we value the wildlife mostly because of its economic contribution to the country, and we also value the wildlife because of its contribution or its connection with our culture, and. Uh, the value of our animals or the value we attach to our animals cannot be separated from the economic aspect. There's a lot of poverty in Africa 
and for you to even talk about the five freedoms or for you to even talk about proper treatment of an animal, it's really a different subject. The same way it is here, I've seen the different types of treatments in, in how people treat their dogs. Those who are really well up treat their dogs so well. I've seen dogs with raincoats here in Portland <laughs> when I personally don't have a raincoat. <laughs> So, so you can imagine in Africa or in Zimbabwe, where an average government worker is earning $500 with three or four children, and then they have a dog or two dogs, the kind of treatment that they will give to that kind of a, kind of a you know, the kind of treatment that they'll give to that dog or to that cat or to that cow. So we value our animals differently, and we treat them differently because of how much we have and how much we, we can spare, and because of the manner in which we were taught, the mindset, the culture, how we've been taught to value these animals. When we see these animals, they're just, they're, they're property. They're instruments, they're property, which, are, which, is, which is supposed to make our lives easy. So a donkey is supposed to help me to plow, because we don't have tractors, we don't have machines, like you do here. So my value, I value my cow, I value my donkey because I know it's going to help me through the farming season. But not because I understand that a donkey is a being. So our value is more on the what direct benefit do I get from the animal, not from an animal welfare perspective like it has feelings, it suffers. That's, uh, that's a totally different conversation altogether. Um. Uh, one of the problems that we also have in Africa is a lack of basic education about animal welfare. The mere fact that most of the people don't get to get to the elementary school definitely means they would never get to know about animal, animal issues because they don't even have the slightest knowledge about what school is. They can't go to school. So if you can go to school, then you don't even know what an animal, how an animal should be treated. And in as much as we get the basic education, there are, um, the laws are there, we have them, but it's difficult for people to talk, to have a conversation around what animals should be having because of uh, the kind of situation we have back at home and uh, we have so many things to deal with. So when you couple poverty and hunger and diseases and especially when our hospitals are, poor, are so poor, we can't talk about taking an animal to a veterinary, a veterinary clinic mm -hmm. because veterinary clinics are expensive and most of them are private. We can't afford them. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just keep your animal there. Sometimes you would never even notice that it is sick. So um, we kind of struggle to provide the education, but it doesn't really make that change because of the kind of background that we have. So what I can say is that, like what I highlighted, context matters and the value and the treatment of these animals depend with the type of class or the type of person or your exposure or how much you have to spend in order for you to be able to treat your animal in a better or in a most acceptable way. <laughs> we also we now move on to the issue of policies and uh, policies and laws. Policies and laws. Now, like what I've highlighted, we d we have different laws here in the United States. Yeah. We know that we have different laws from one state to a, to the other. That is also the same thing that happens in Africa. We have different policies and laws that regulate the use and the treatment and possession of animals from one country to the other. So you find that in Kenya, they have a different perspective on how certain animals are supposed to be treated. In 2015, when uh, we had the CITES, um, the, 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 when those CITES, the COP17, Kenya banned 100 and five tons of ivory. Yet in Zimbabwe, that office is like a few meters away from my office, and I actually know that guy. We were busy counting how many ivory stockpiles we have. And we are busy piling them and keeping them because we value 
our ivory. Because we believe in a sustainable utilization policy. We believe that our wildlife should benefit us. We are poor. So when we see the resource, the elephant, or when we see this dust, we are seeing a resource that we are able to sell and get money, and then we use the, the resources that we get from it to pl plow back into conservation or in administrative work. So you see that even in Africa, there are different policies, there are different laws that regulate um, the use and the treatment of animals. So in Kenya, they do not hunt. In Zimbabwe, we hunt. We are looking for people who want to hunt because we believe we need to make use of our resource to benefit the present and the future generation. So we have different policies and different laws that are already in existence. We also have other general um, policies and laws like the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, which was um, enacted in the 1980s in, in Zimbabwe. The laws are there, but the laws are not enforced because of the different reasons that we're trying to explain to you, the culture, the value. A police officer can see someone kicking a dog and it means nothing to them because either they do not even know it is an offense to kick the dog or it's just a dog that's just being kicked. So what? Mm -hmm. A police officer can see a, a, a donkey being used to plow and being um, exerted or being overworked and being abused, but they may not necessarily arrest the person mm -hmm. because of ignorance or because it's not important they have other important issues or they have other important crimes to prioritize. So. Mm -hmm. Those are the um, issues and differences when it comes to policies and laws. Yeah. So this is the background. Uh, this is the background of animal warfare from Kenya and Zimbabwe and in Africa. And what we've done is that um, having had the privilege to come to the United States, we got exposed to a new concept of animal warfare. We do have animal laws, like we, I told you. Some of them are written down, some of them they are myths and beliefs, but they have helped in protecting animals. But when we came here to the United States through our program, we were exposed to, no, an animal has feelings. An animal is an individual. An animal deserves to live and die naturally. Mm -hmm. That is something new that I personally didn't even know about. Because I'm coming from a point where these animals, we use them for work, we use them for labor, dogs are supposed to protect us from thieves, and it's a different, so, so we learned new concepts, and uh, whilst um, I was studying in 2017, and gathering all the information at school, I, with other friends last year, decided to start Speak Out for Animals, which is an organization that is organized to educate Africans about animal laws and about the value of animals and about protection of animals. So that is what our organization is doing, raising awareness. Because the laws are there. What is just lacking is implementation. And what is just lacking is the understanding why the laws are there. So that is what Speak Out for Animals is um, organized to do. And... Uh, <coughs> Go back. Okay. So what we've done since uh, last year, one slide back again. Yes, that's yeah, okay. Sorry. So since uh, since um, the time that I graduated last year in July, I went to Zimbabwe and I trained ten lawyers, and I was funded by uh, Lewis and Clark Center for Animal Law Studies to go and train ten lawyers. So I. I compiled and compressed all the information I learned in a year and I just went and taught 10 people in one week. <laughs> so it was really intense, it was really, you need to learn, you need to know, you need to know, you need to know and understand that these animals are important, these animals need to be respected, these animals need to be loved. Because one thing that I realized is that loving and respecting animals is a behavior that is learned. So the fact that we are Africans or we are Americans or that is not an excuse because an animal does not know that. An animal just deserves to be treated right. An animal just deserves to live long the same way we deserve to live long. 
So I went and trained 10 lawyers and uh, that is Priska right here. She's one of the 10 lawyers that I trained and she has been the lawyer that has been on ground in Zimbabwe and she has been doing most of the groundwork. So um, she went to back to the law school where she lands because she's a recent graduate to the University of Zimbabwe and um, she started the student chapters. So from the student chapters, she is now, um, these guys in uh, wearing clothes, those are the students. Now, th so they went to a high school in, um, in Mashingo, which is like 400 kilometers from where our office is based, to just go and educate this uh, fishing community to say no to cyanide poisoning. Because this community, they stay with a lot of elephants in their cases of cyanide poisoning. So Parks and Wildlife approached our organization and said, we know you're into education. Please come and inform this community, especially the school, not to participate in illegal uh, fishing or illegal uh, poaching or cyanide poisoning. Come and speak to the kids, and they will go and tell their parents about the message. So you find that. Uh, we have two groups, we have two student chapters. One is called the Great Zimbabwe Law School, the other one is the University of Zimbabwe. They're 400 kilometers apart, two different law schools, and Priska has been running that. And um, I'm happy to announce that Priska got the scholarship and she'll be joining us here in August. So thanks to Lewis and Clark for that. And she'll be the second Zimbabwean to come and also learn about this program. From then, uh, from the student, uh, from the student chapter, on Friday, I woke up on Facebook and then I just saw a picture. That's um, a guy called Innocent. He's one of the committee members from the University of Zimbabwe. They went to a school right next into the neighborhood, and I don't know how they did it. Because if I explain, I would be lying because I wasn't told. I was also only I only saw a picture of the student chapters going to the student members going to high school now to go and talk about animals are important, let's look after them, they are precious, this is how we treat them. With the basic minimum knowledge that I imparted, they are also just sharing the basic knowledge of what they understand about animal protection. So that's Innocent at an assembly telling um, 200 people about animal protection. And that's, the last picture shows um, a guy called Amos, he's part of the student chapters in that other law school, Great Zimbabwe, which is 400 kilometers away, they went last, the other Friday, to SPCA to just visit and see Wonderful. and really understand. I didn't tell them. It's just their own initiative of what is this girl talking about and why is it important? So they went to the SPCA to understand about animal welfare and they were taught. And now they really got a good lesson because at the SPCA, they really, really know. They got a good lesson, they were taught about the five freedoms. So I saw on the Facebook they were talking about animals should be free from pain, they need food, they need shelter, they need... I'm like, yeah, at least something is happening. So he took a picture and that's uh, the SPCA. And like what I'm saying, culture, context, economic situation, that's the kind of shelters that we have in our country. People come and adopt these kind of dogs in our country. And one, one good thing that emerged out of this is that after they were told that so many um, at the SPCA, the membership has gone down. Most of the people that are members at the SPCA are white people because they have appreciate the value and the companionship of animals. And black people are not really interested and they, even if they're interested, they cannot afford to adopt or to pay the fees or to take their, dog, uh, their animals for veterinary care. So what these students did is they went and approached the school and said, we are throwing a lot of rice and sadza and bones. Please give us the leftovers and we can take them to the shelter. So I'm still also waiting to hear the approval whether the dean will allow or the authorities will allow to get extra food and take it to the SPCA. So um, this is what we, we, we have been doing from the training and to the st student chapters and the student chapters also going out and uh, training. Slide back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
one, yeah, that one. And um, so most of our work is responsive, um, is responsive to the things that are happening. When we saw this um, headline sometime in April, that's when the students were like, okay, stray dogs are being shot, why? Because people are not taking care, because what's happening? That's when they decided to go to SPCA to really understand what is going on and why are these dogs being shot and not taken to the shelters. And then they went to the SPCA and then they were told of the different problems that are happening. And now we want to see on how we can work on those issues. And then the next thing that we are also working on is the Zimbabwean Abattoir. So sometime in October, an abattoir was... Um, an abattoir was established, which, is, which was meant to slaughter 70 donkeys per day. And with a population of about 175,000 donkeys, in less than five years, all the donkeys in Zimbabwe will be extinct. So the, the Chinese are approaching the rural people and saying, we will give you $40, give us your donkey, because they want the donkeys for um, medicinal purposes and they want the skin for, I don't know, you know what I mean, how they... So, so we, we, we wrote a, put, a petition with the government together with other animal welfare organizations to say the donkeys are important for draft power, the donkeys are important to the community. It wasn't really more of an animal welfare discussion. Or we were not really advancing that the donkey has feelings because it is a wrong, it is a wrong argument altogether. But it was more about putting the human being first and how they benefit from the animal but yet indirectly knowing that our ultimate goal is to save the donkeys from trade. So this is a headline that was in the newspaper last week that despite the arbitral not being open, we still have 105 donkeys being slaughtered. And you wonder how, how and why and why it's happening when the arbitral is closed, but there's business outside the arbitral and you, you, you don't understand. So it's a lot of issues going on in and behind camera when it comes to this. So what we've done is uh, we've tried, um, I'm still trying to organize and mobilize resources so that the students who were lobbying and having discussions about this, instead of them going home to sit, I want them to go to this area and just go and educate the community about the value of donkeys and why they shouldn't sell the donkeys and make them understand the value of the donkeys more than just getting $40 and then they don't have their resource. So this is what has been happening in, uh, um, in Zimbabwe. So this year when, um, we can move to the next. So when Winnie came, we decided to, um, we decided to join hands and work for the same purpose of educating um, educating people in Africa about the value of animals and the animal laws. So we will explain um, how our work will roll out in Kenya. Yeah, so um, in Kenya we have so many laws that protect animals, uh, companion animals, wild animals, but of course we are geared towards wild animals because of the kind of economic value we get from them. So our protection of the wildlife is not about uh, the animal welfare aspect, but is the economic value we get it because we get because of tourism, because our wild animals in Kenya attract tourism a lot, and we get a lot of revenue from tourism. So when we want to protect the animals, we are guarding them because of the interest that we have, and that is the economic value. So uh, in as much as we have the good laws they are never put into place to advance animal welfare. So what SOFA is planning to do in Kenya is to raise awareness, to conduct campaigns in different regions, uh, to um, educate people. We are planning to start a, a curriculum in Kenya, a training program in Kenya for uh, judicial officers, for lawyers, uh, for students, for law students in campuses and for veterinary officials to just learn what animal welfare is all about. And especially for judicial officers because these matters regarding animal abuse hardly come to their attention. And even if it were to come to their attention, there is lack of jurisprudence. 
So they, they, they may not have any reference point apart from interpreting the law. And we, we want to educate them in a way that when they are interpreting the law, they don't just interpret it in terms of what is right for the people, but what is right for the animal's welfare. So we plan to uh, do campaigns there. And uh, the kinds of things that uh, we expect to have issues with is uh, the next slide. Okay. Yeah, so um, the problem with uh, Kenya is that uh, we now have, uh, initially, we all, uh, initially the entire country was following like the general laws from the national government, but now we have county governments which have, uh, which are now uh, the custodians of animal welfare. So um, ha having to um, coordinate the county governments to have them to like embrace animal welfare is going to be a difficult task because different counties have different issues to deal with. So getting this county to pass this law does not necessarily mean that you will get this other county to get the law. So uh, that would be much of a challenge. In some counties, we may not get um, support. Uh, and it depends with also the type of animal that they value so much in that region. So getting them to pass laws regarding animal welfare would be a bit tricky because um, they attach different values. And also uh, lack of resources to move around because you have to go through the 47 counties to educate all of them would be a very hard task because of resources and lack of manpower, especially because in Kenya right now we are six uh, animal law uh, graduates. So getting the six of us to move around the entire country mm -hmm. is very, very difficult <clears throat> because we also have our own jobs to do and um, it's, it, it takes a lot of time and uh, we have to explain a lot for people to understand what we are talking about. And then another challenge which may be the most difficult thing to do is a lack of interest in the subject. Mm -hmm. You may just introduce it and people will be like, what is she talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are we together, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's going to be difficult to try to explain to people that now this is animal welfare, you should treat your dog very well. And yet they know the dog is supposed to sleep outside at, at night to guard the compound, you know? And you want to tell them, treat your dog right, uh, clean it every day, take it to the vet, you know, it's going to be a problem. And, but those are some of the discussions that we need to have around and get people to understand. So SOFA is planning to expand to Kenya. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Kenya and I'm mm -hmm. going to Kenya tomorrow actually. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of work I plan to start once I get there and get it moving. And uh, still on the, on the issue of lack of interest in the field, from a Zimbabwean perspective, and since I've already started, um, I still remember when I sent the advert to say uh, animal law training last year, and I sent it in, in a WhatsApp group with, my, with the people that I learned. I mean, the, those were the first people I thought of, like, you know, with all the excitement. And they were like, how do you go to America to go and study animals? Why do you waste ticket money and opportunities to go and study about animals in America? We want to come to America to do some, to work and, you know, why, why animal law? Why, why waste time? So I didn't, I, I got discouraged, to be honest, the first time. I really got discouraged because I thought those were the people who were going to accept and say, oh, good for you, and they didn't. Then I went to, and I, then I, I left them and I approached the dean of the law school, where, where, when I, where I studied, uh, at the University of Zimbabwe. But it was six years ago, they probably remember me a bit, but I wasn't outstanding, so it was. But then I was like, I'm in America and I'm studying animal law and I'm the only Zimbabwean and this is an opportunity so that we are a step ahead of other African countries and you know, just making them believe how important and why we need to have this as a subject in law schools. And they're like, animals, no. <laughs> animals, not now. It's not the right subject. It's not the right. Because where are the students going to work? What's the value of animals? Who's going to teach? Who's going to... You, it was a lot of... From the authorities themselves. That's when I then decided to change the strategy. Let me get the recent graduates, because they're still fresh, they're still looking for opportunities, they're still open-minded. And then I trained the 10, and then they are still connected to the students. 
with whom they learned with. So it's very easy to pass on the message. So the idea is to have, have them interested like what they're doing so that they can create pressure on their own at the schools to say we want to learn about this officially because learning about it one, um, one hour per, per month is not enough. We want it as an official academic subject. Mm -hmm. So that's the strategy we've used to deal with that lack of interest in the field. And the most common question, obviously, when it comes to animal law is, so where, where are we going to work? Where are the jobs? That's, that's the first and most common question because people are going to school so that they can be employed. So I asked them and I said, especially those that I trained last year, you spent four years studying law, different subjects, co contracts, environmental. Has any one of you ever gone to their lecturer or professor to ask where they're going to work? Mm -hmm. So why, why is this field special? Why am I supposed to tell you where you're going to work when you spent four years and you've just spent a week and you already won jobs from, from animal law? Why? Why should I, you know? Because I wanted to, them to think. I told them when I went to the USA, no one told me about how to start SOFA and how to run SOFA. I realized there's a gap in my country. There's a need in my country. And SOFA is my own initiative. So come up with your own initiative. And you're not doing me a favor. We're doing the animals a favor. So if you work and if you understand that we're doing this work for the animals, then you will have so many ideas and so many. That's why I just see on Facebook, they were there, they were did this, they did this, because everyone is saying, it's for the animals. You told us to be innovative and you told us to find ways of looking after the animals. So that's how we managed to maneuver and find ways to generate interest in this field. And um, so to conclude, Like what Winnie has already said, what we plan to do is just education, education, and education. Education on the value of animals. Mm -hmm. Education that animals have feelings. Animals also feel pain. Mm -hmm. They are also social beings. They also have families. This is what we learned, and this is what we've seen, and this is what we want them to understand, and this is what we want them to also pass on from in their communities, friends and families the same message. Because when we, I, 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 for me, when I came to the zoo and I saw this is Paki, the elephant, mm -hmm. this is Paki. To me it was weird because I've never heard an elephant being given a name or an animal with, with a name, you know, because we have many elephants. So it was a bit, but right now my mindset has changed because I'm now exposed. I didn't understand that they also have families, but yet I see pictures in movies and on Facebook of an elephant with its, you know. But it's 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 we were not we are not taught to think at that level that this is a mother with its babies. Mm -hmm. So that's the what we want to raise that consciousness level we want to raise in Africa. So this is a group of the University of Zimbabwe students that gone to a field trip uh, at Twala. And um, yeah, we ask for your support. Our work is merely to go and uh, educate and tell them to value and love animals. And uh, if you're interested in supporting us, you can find us on Facebook, Speak Out for Animals. You can find us on Twitter. You can get our email addresses. We're still happy to have your support so that our student chapters run well. And so that these students, when they're on holiday, they also get to do practical work. They go out in the communities and teach and raise awareness and that we need, uh, we need resources for. I, yeah, and in terms of the resources that we need, it, it is not necessarily financially. Yeah. What you can support us with are books about animals. Okay. Uh, if you're able to travel to Africa, you're much welcome. Yes. You can come conduct seminars with us, train people with us, tell them about Wonderful. what animals are, yeah. yeah, and how we should treat them. That is the kind of support we expect. And we also expect you to speak to us because if you speak from a Western perspective to an African country mm -hmm. about animal welfare, they, they would better appreciate it because they know in terms of advancement, you are better placed than we are. 
So um, we would likely appreciate what you would give to us. So if you if you are able to talk to our governments and tell them about, or our judicial officers, and tell them about this animal welfare and how they should treat animals, that would be good too. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Questions? Could you talk to us about farm animals? Farm animals? Chickens, ducks, pigs, uh, for meat in Africa. Yeah, we, um, so we, we do have, so in Zimbabwe, for example, most of our population is centered in the rural areas. And we do keep pigs, goats, cows, mostly for, for meat. And this is for subsistence. It's for family consumption. Mm -hmm. It's not like the, the cuffles and the apples, where it's uh, for commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. But however, we do also have those commercial entities centered in the outskirts, um, where they also just uh, breed these animals for meat and for agriculture. and. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the, the treatment or the bad treatment or the pain and the suffering is probably the same. What, maybe, what, what differs maybe is the method. Here, because of advancements and machines, they process more animals faster. Us, because we don't have so much, I mean, our technology is not as fast and it's not as efficient. We slaughter less. But otherwise, yes, we do also, it's almost the same thing, but it's at a at a smaller, it's at a smaller scale. I've seen the cuffles and I was like, we're so far away from there and I hope we do not get there. Yes. But you do have facilities where you're raising a lot of animals for mm -hmm. Yeah, we do, we do have, I, I don't know what, what, what you mean when you say a lot, because... Um, it's not for the family, it's for profit. Uh, mostly, in, in, the rural area, in the rural areas, mostly it's for family. It's for family. For profit, yes, of course, they do trade and they do sell. Like when a child needs to go to school, they can sell their car for 500 and take them to school. But mostly it's for, it's for family consumption and they can only trade. Like for example, there's a time sometime last year where you can, where you can either pay your school fees with a goat. Because we have cash crisis and that's how valuable the goat is. So you either take your goat to the school and your kids and pay your fees and the child goes to school, that kind of a thing. But then we do have commercial um, companies and entities that just focus on commercial. We have like Ivins, which focuses on chickens and they do thousands and thousands. The same way it's done here, but it's a lesser magnitude, it's a lesser scale as compared to the agricultural um, Farms here in the United the States. Laws, are there laws to protect those farm animal welfare? Yes, the laws are there. The laws are there that prohibit from uh, overriding, that prohibit from uh, ki kicking, that prohibit from neglect. That for the general standard animal neglect and animal welfare conditions apply to all animals, domestic and farmed animals, and of course the exemptions. The exceptions where it doesn't apply, like for example, if you're if you're raising an animal specifically to slaughter it for food, then definitely that animal warfare aspect does not apply. So the laws are there that protect these farm animals, but it is the enforcement that lacks because of ignorance and because resources the police officer will not be looking for who's abusing who's overriding who's overloading the donkey and the cows that's they won't do that because there are no resources to even do that yes do people uh, feel strongly there that they must eat meat to be healthy and survive you can take that one um, i think um it, it's not such a strong feeling, it's just the way they have been brought up. Mm -hmm. So since, you ha since they were young, you've been eating meat. So, mm -hmm. And no one has told you that eating meat is bad. Mm -hmm. oh, the only emphasis that is there is about health purposes. You can reduce it because it causes this, or you're mm -hmm. going to get this, Go or you, you will 
uh, yeah, the, those kind of things. Only health issues are the ones that come into play when you think about meat. But we don't have to think, we, we've not been trained to think about it in the aspect of animals are suffering. Animals feel pain. We don't have that concept. So we, the, the only time you get someone cutting meat is because they know their health is in danger mm -hmm. and they're trying to protect themselves, yeah. not because they're trying to protect the animal. Mm -hmm. So it's just the mentality that we have. And, we need, and that's why we need this kind of education to educate people that animals do feel pain. And even in as much as you want to eat the meat, then practice human slaughter, which we also don't have. We have them, but people in their homes, they can just slaughter God. They'll just do it there in their compound. There's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. So there are those kind of things that I need, that there's a need to train them on how best to treat animals, consider animal welfare because they are also beings. So that's what we need to do. Yeah. And I also want to add on that mostly it's for the health, for health reasons. And also, um, besides, the, besides the health reasons, depending with how privileged you are, you know. Mm. Meat is not something that's eaten every day. Mm. It's it de depending with the family. And I'm talking about the majority. Like in my country, the economic situation right now is bad. Mm. So even people in the cities who are used to eating meat every single day, they are not affording to have meat because it's expensive. So you find that in the rural areas, they don't even eat meat every single day. It's only when people from the city like us go to the rural area, when my, and then my grandmother, to show she's happy, she slaughters the goat, she slaughters the cow. Or when there's a function, they slaughter the cow, they slaughter the goat. Or when there's a special function, they can slaughter. Or when, um, yeah, when, when something special is happening, that's when, they can, well, that's when they can slaughter. But because of economic or because of the poverty that I told you about, they, they can't eat the meat as much as they want to, but they, they would want to eat the meat. And also, like, because when you grow up suffering and not having that meat, the moment you become a lawyer, get an extra dollar, the next thing I'm looking for the best rib. Because in my mind, I'm thinking it's a, it's a status issue. Now I need to eat the best meat. I need to, you know, I invite my friends, come, we're having a braai, different types of meats. Because I'm now showing that I can afford to have the meat. So come, let's have the meat. That's, those are some of the dynamics that are involved when it comes to having or to eating meat. Yeah, oh, well, you mentioned about the, the economic situation in Zimbabwe. I don't know if you could explain that briefly. I know there's a lot, there's been a lot that's gone on and just how that's, like what the status of things are in yeah. relation. So, I mean, um, an average government worker, a nurse, a teacher earns $400, $500. Mm -hmm. and a month or a year? A month. A month. A month. And our families, like where I come from, we have five siblings, plus my mom and my dad. So if it's 500, 500, 1,000, with five kids, to go to university is 500 per semester per child. Oh. To go to primary school, primary education, you pay about $100. High school, two, three, four hundred. College, 500. And you have three, four, five kids. So that's why I'm saying that for my mother now to even think about going to buy chicken for five dollars when she hasn't even paid the fees for everyone, it's difficult. But the day that she makes extra or she's in a happy mood, she'll go and look for that chicken and say, Come, today we am having a good we're having a good meal. And that means having meat. Because the normal meal is vegetables and starch and much stuff like that. Is it so the economic situation? Is it is it just the wages or are the like the inflation? Like is the cost of things higher because of? In Zimbabwe, I can explain. To, I can explain to you like yeah. personally. There's a lot that's been happening in yeah. terms of the economic situation and 
I'm, I'm free to explain to you, but okay. yes, we do have inflation, yeah. crash crisis, I'm sure you see that in the newspapers, and uh, yeah. yeah, so all that also comes into play, affecting how you treat the animal and what you can eat and what you cannot eat. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is for both of you. What is it that motivated both of you to get into animal law? Being that you have a background that you have that doesn't consider that important, what was it that made you different? Okay. Both okay. of you. All right. Uh, for me, um, having had a background in uh, law, mm -hmm. I got a chance to uh, participate in the activities of uh, Kenya Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in my interaction with the staff at Kenya Wildlife Service mm -hmm. uh, staff, I understood so many things concerning animals, but I didn't know anything about companion animals. Mm -hmm. I must say that that concept mm -hmm. I got it from here. Mm -hmm. So back in Kenya, we really value our wildlife, as mm -hmm. I said earlier, and that is because of the economic aspect right. of it. Mm -hmm. So um, the government really pays attention when there is a wildlife crime. But there are wildlife crimes that go unprosecuted, mm -hmm. or when they are prosecuted, they never get to the final stage. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the who is involved mm -hmm. in the wildlife issue. Mm -hmm. And so in my, in my interaction with them, I understood that there are so many things that go unnoticed. And that's because either someone has done something to make sure this thing does mm -hmm. not proceed mm -hmm. to the next level. So it would probably go to court and then the entire process is just frustrated and no one is punished for it. And of course, when there is something involved that is very big and the government is concerned, they would really take it up. And so um, when I was going through that, I understood that there is, um, our animals are suffering. There is need for people to learn about protection of animals. And for me, I was concerned about the wildlife. Mm -hmm. And I come from the coastal area where people love to fish. Mm -hmm. So they go do, doing all sorts of fishing activities like dynamite fishing. They don't care about the environment and everything. And these are local people. They have not been educated about mm -hmm. what they're supposed to do. So they go fish. You see how they've cast the net and sometimes they've caught so many fish. And you know, the fish are just lifeless and everything. Mm -hmm. it, it is horrible. When you see it, sometimes it is very discouraging. If you see the kind of ponds some people have, it is so dirty for a fish to be there. But they keep stalking fish, you know? Yeah. And th there are some things which really, you know, they make you feel like, I want to make a change here. Mm -hmm. There is need for a change. So that is kind of what really motivated me to come to uh, Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. And actually, I expected that uh, we would just be talking about wild animals. But from here, I also understood, because I also didn't know how should I treat the dog. So I love dogs, yes, but I didn't know how well to take care of them. But when I came here, I also understood that uh, domestic animals, companion animals, they're animals too, which need a lot of protection from us. Yeah. And you? Uh, oh, will you I think he has a question before. Oh, no. yeah, oh, yes. right. This is the I same question. Yeah, um, for me, the first time I, I, I started to have an encounter with animal laws or wildlife law was a year after I graduated mm -hmm. and um, Parks and Wildlife, which is more like US Fish and Wildlife, mm -hmm. they wanted a contract worker, someone who had just graduated, someone with a legal mind that they would just file papers and, you know, just just be a legal person in the organization. So, yeah, I got the three months contract. So whilst I was having that, on that, well, whilst I was hired on that uh, three months contract, mm -hmm. there's, an, there's a ranger who shot a poacher and the, and the poacher died. Yeah. <laughs> and like this ranger was sentenced to death. Oh, really? Right. The poacher? Yes, because the poacher, in as much as we have the uh, indemnity act that protects the rangers and the people that protect mm. wildlife, there's what is called minimum force. You, you need to know when to use the firearm. 
So the, the pojo was running away, was fleeing away, because the bullet came in from this end. And you can tell someone is, you know. So uh, how, how do you use maximum force to kill someone who's running away? In that kind of a situation, at least disarm them, you know. Then you arrest. But killing someone who's running away, that one is a different. In as much as we're protecting animals, the government was like, this one, no. We will not allow people being trigger happy. In as much as you're protecting this wildlife, we need also to set an example to other rangers that know when to use maximum or minimum force. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's during that time when I'm that new lawyer and, you know, the three months. So I quickly wrote a proposal. I said, this situation is dangerous for our animals. Mm -hmm. And for our rangers, because the rangers were like, we're not going to kill, we're not going to shoot, we're not going to arrest, because they don't want to go to jail. Mm -hmm. So that meant our animals were now in danger, because right. the rangers were not interested at all. So that's when I started just being involved in the case. We went there, we saw where, the, where it all happened, and then I went and took the person out of bail, the range out of, I mean, the ranger out of yeah. the cells, and then tried to apply yeah. for bail. I'm still new and still trying to understand. But when I was doing my work, it was more for the ranger, not for the animal, you know. So people in, in parks and the rangers got to know, there's a new lawyer, she's interested in our work. And mm -hmm. so I wrote a proposal to parks and I said, I need to go around the country to train them about the laws. Wow. When, what to use, minimum force, maximum force mm -hmm. and stuff. So instead of three months, I did six months, went throughout the country, trained all the rangers about, these are your boundaries. This is what the law says about animals. This is what the law says about your labor rights and your, you know, mm -hmm. this is just, that's, that's for me, that's how it started. Then I got a job to be a prosecutor because I was hired as a contract oh. worker. I was like, bye, I'm going. Because <laughs> I needed security. I needed to also put food on my table. Oh. Then I told them I'm leaving until you put a permanent post. Then, yeah, you know where to find me. I left. <laughs> But there were still animal cases coming, and they would call. We have this uh, giraffe which has been killed. We have this lion. We have this. And then Cecil the lion happened. Mm -hmm. 2015. They posted an advert. I got the job. I joined parks. There was now that uh, permanent post. Because they realized that it is important to have lawyers dedicating their time and practice to protecting animals. Then I, I was attending Cecil the Lion case, working with the prosecutor, because I wasn't a prosecutor anymore, but I knew the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. So negotiating procedures and everything, I knew. Let's do this, let's do that, let's do this, let's do that. And then, because I was also just interested, f mostly for human, right. yeah. Then I got uh, one of the clients who came and she was like, I think you're interested and you know a little bit what you're trying to do. There's an opportunity to go to Lewis and Clark, mm -hmm. if you're interested, mm -hmm. to do animal law. I got the flyer, I put it in my desk, I'm like, <laughs> I'll deal with that later on. <laughs> then when it was like three, four weeks to the closing date, I was like, okay, where is that paper? <laughs> <laughs> you know, where is that paper, where is that paper, you know? And then I applied and I got the place and uh, yeah, when I came here, I thought I was going to learn about um, wildlife as well, but I had gone through the courses offered and whatever and I was like I would do most of the wildlife because dogs and cats no 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 and then I came here and then yes you need dogs and cats a part core foundation <laughs> you know <laughs> you know so so from just coming from I'm doing it for the organization it's just <laughs> my job people I need, need to be protected I just got this genuine excitement and passion about this job after really getting deep, deep, deep much into um, the work at, at Lewis and Clark. Because my perspective is broadened and it's, it's now better because it's all encompassing and it's not just wildlife, it's, it's everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what has brought me this far. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Your struggles in Africa are similar to the struggles we have in North America even with the uh, wildlife that we both possess on our lands mm -hmm. you know you got the you just have different animals you have lions and you mm -hmm. have elephants, elephants and, and those mm -hmm. beautiful creatures mm -hmm. on our lands we have elk we have deer we have 
Yeah. You know, possums. We have all the but different types of animals, yeah. and they're similar the way we the way we manage manage them. Uh, wildlife goes out and destroys all the all the wolves. Yes. It'll destroy the, the various birds that feast on on salmon. They get rid of them because the salmon are are supposed to be protected. We have similar similar things, and I don't think that we're any more innocent uh, with our with our with our approach to protecting our wildlife, our our creatures, mm -hmm. than we have in other parts of the world. We may seem that way. You know, we have a few people in here that that treasure animals, and we don't want to eat them. We don't want to. But uh, overall, uh, I think it's a pretty science. And we could certainly use your energy uh, um, <laughs> in our own country. Yeah. So. I'm glad you're both thank here. You so, yeah, thank, thank you so much. much. And um, so. I think, um, let me take this opportunity to, to thank um, Peter thank and Chechen for inviting us, because mm -hmm. that is also one other thing that we'll be doing here in the United States when we get opportunities like this to share with you the true mm -hmm. story, the reality of what is happening in Africa. It is a privilege, because you get first-hand information of what's happening, you get to ask us questions, we get to tell you how we feel, without social media or media lying to you or pretending that things are okay or pretending that, no, we are here to, to share stories, to share ideas, for you to understand our stories and for you to also, for us to also understand the story. So we value such meetings and we value you <coughs> when you also listen to us and when you also ask questions and when we also learn from you. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.